looking today at Judas Iscariot, the, the one who has gone down in the history books as the traitor of our Lord. Matthew 26, verse 14. One of the twelve, whose name was Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests and said, What will you give me if I deliver him over to you? And they paid him thirty pieces of silver. And from that moment he sought an opportunity to betray him. Let's pray. God in heaven, help us to heed the warnings of this story. May we not be like Judas. May we honor our Lord and cherish Him always. Point all of us to the goodness of Jesus today. Save the lost and strengthen your people. Anoint the hearing and the preaching. Guide everything that happens. Give me, God, your strength from above. In Christ's name, amen. Our plot line is well into the Passion Week of Christ. Last week, we observed a woman who lavishly worshipped Jesus Christ by anointing Him with a very expensive ointment in an alabaster jar, but received the disciples' scorn for it but nevertheless also received the Savior's praise. This week we encounter the disciples, or rather, this week we encounter the disciple who whipped up the other 11 against that woman who worshiped Jesus Christ. We've already been introduced to him once or twice, but Today, we really get some insight into who he is and what he's done. He is a traitor. Judas Iscariot was a traitor. So much of a fifth column was he that actually, if you look up his name, really and truly in the dictionary, right beside it is the word traitor. Typically, he was a traitor. That's what he'll always be known for, is being a traitor. A little poem I taught, that I learned and then taught when we went through Matthew 10 and were introduced to the 12, goes like this. Peter and Andrew, James and John, Philip and Bartholomew, Matthew next, and Thomas too, James the less, and Judas the greater, Simon the zealot, and Judas the traitor. He is the traitor. That's what he's always going to be known for. That's how the scriptures remember him. And if he has done anything good for us, and for the kingdom of God, the one good thing that he did was teach us what not to be. You look at Judas and you see what not to be. And today's text is about his initial act of treason against our Lord and King, Jesus Christ. This is when he really gets into it. We'll see the time of his treason. We'll see the person himself, Judas, the traitor committed treason, the people with whom he commits treason, and then the action of treason itself. One, two, three, four, the time, the person, the people, the action. Judas, the traitor. Let's look at the time of Judas's betrayal initially. Now, we don't have clear time indicators in our text today. Last week's text, if you remember, 
happened on the Saturday before the crucifixion, which was on the Friday, as per the Gospel of John. The woman anointed Jesus with the expensive ointment on the Saturday before the Friday of the crucifixion. It was before the triumphal entry that she committed that act of worship, lavishly adoring her Lord. The priest's plot to kill Jesus is exposed in chapter 26, verses 3 through 5. We know that that happened on the Tuesday. After Jesus had spent the entire day preaching in the temple and then preaching on the Mount of Olives. The day starts with his curse on the fig tree. He goes into the temple, preaches in the temple, pronounces seven woes upon the religious leaders, and then leaves and then preaches the Olivet Discourse all in really one day. And at the end of that day, as it comes to a conclusion, we learn in verses 4 through 5 of chapter 26 that at the end of that day, the chief priest, as a reaction to his preaching, began to plot his death and crucifixion. That was also on the Tuesday before the crucifixion. While they are plotting in verses 3 through 5, we see today in verses 14 through 16 that Judas solves their little quandary. So we can, I think we're very safe to assume that today's text happens during or just after the Tuesday meeting. So we're back kind of in the chronology of Matthew here, I suspect. On the Tuesday, Jesus called down the seven woes on the religious leaders and, and prophesied God's judgment upon them, upon the temple, upon Jerusalem. That provoked them to plot his death. Judas would have seen their faces as Jesus was preaching at them. And Jesus or Judas, after that sermon of Jesus at some point, rose to meet the needs or the demands of the chief priests who Judas would have known by then were unhappy with Jesus, certainly by the looks on their faces Jesus was preaching to them, and even by the fact that Jesus told him with the other 11 in verse 2 that they will, he himself, Jesus, will be betrayed or delivered over to the chief priests, scribes, and Pharisees. So Judas, this is timing of his betrayal of Christ is sometime just after the Olivet Discourse, and the Olivet Discourse was on the Tuesday. So we're back into the chronology of the events. That's the timing of the betrayal. Look at the person of Judas Iscariot. We first meet him in Matthew chapter 10. Jesus introduces the 12 apostles, the 12 disciples where he was introduced as Judas Iscariot by Matthew who betrayed him. Judas Iscariot who betrayed him. So even the initial mention of Judas is that he's the traitor. So we know that this creature for 16 chapters now is Christ preached and he preached throughout Galilee and then he went down to Jerusalem during the Passover season. This odious creature had we know embedded himself into the disciples as a parasitical sleeper cell waiting to detonate. Satan had tied himself into Jesus' inner circle with this traitor. The other disciples didn't detect it. At least there's no hint that they did. Judas witnessed the miracles of Jesus Christ. Judas ate the loaves and the fish that Jesus multiplied. Judas had seen by this point the resurrected Lazarus. Judas listened to Christ preach. Judas would have preached himself, as Jesus said. The apostles went out to preach. The disciples went out to preach. 
He might have even been a recipient of persecution, as Jesus told them, and they were going to go out and preach in the Judean countryside, that they would receive persecution. He may have even been a recipient of persecution. I think it's very likely that he was. So he ate with Christ. He ate the bread and the loaves that Christ multiplied. He saw the miracles of Christ, even the resurrection of Lazarus. Listen to Christ preach. He himself preached the gospel. And to everyone who looked on, he was one of the disciples. The disciples even considered him one of their own. This is Judas. In fact, so trusted was Judas in the inner circle of disciples that Jesus had made him the treasurer of the ministry. So Jesus' itinerant preaching ministry, he would have received donations to live on. And Judas, he appointed the treasurer of the ministry. We're told in John chapter 12, verse 6, that Judas used his position as the treasurer of the ministry to steal from the treasury. So we, he's a thief. And we know from John, the Gospel of John, that Judas was the one who whipped up the other disciples against the woman who anointed Christ with the expensive ointment in the previous text. He was the hypocrite who whipped up the other ones. He was the infiltrator. He was a thief. He was a traitor. All the while, everyone considered him one of the disciples. So keep that in mind. There is the person of Judas. Math, or sorry, Psalm 41 verse 9 says, Even my close friends in whom I trusted, who ate my bread, has lifted up his heel against me. That's Judas. So, we have the time of the betrayal, sometime after the Olivet Discourse on the Tuesday. We have the person of the betrayal, that's Judas. And now we have the people to whom Judas betrays our Lord. Judas betrayed our Lord to the chief priests. Verse 14, then one of the twelve whose name was Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests and said, What will you give me if I deliver him over to you? Those were the same men who wanted to trap Jesus. Jesus spoke of them in chapter 21, verse 46 said, although they were seeking to arrest him, or sorry, Matthew spoke of them, although they were seeking to arrest him, they feared the crowds because they held him to be a prophet. And then we note in Matthew 26, verses 3 through 5, then the chief priests and the elders of the people gathered in the palace of the high priest, whose name was Caiaphas, and plotted together in order to arrest Jesus by stealth and kill him. But they said, not during the feast, lest there be an uproar among the people. And so Jesus had actually spent a good part of his ministry denouncing these top men of Judaism, these top men of religion, these top men of Judean society. He had spent a good part of his ministry denouncing them, especially the last few chapters, the last 24 hours of his life. And in fact, um, these men were so powerful that they ruled the temple. They sat on the Supreme Court, the Sanhedrin of Israel, of Judea. They were the leading men of Jerusalem and Judea. They were religious and civil leaders. And one thing that they all certainly shared in common was that they hated Jesus Christ. And Judas knew it. He knew it because of the look on their faces when Jesus was preaching to them. And he knew it because Jesus told him, as he told the other disciples. They were the chief priests to whom Judas betrayed our Lord were the sophisticated part of the ruling class. They were the higher-ups of society. That's who they were. Judas, in switching teams, wasn't just going from good to evil. We, we, we see that in the text very clearly. He's on the good side, and then he goes to the bad side. He's on the 
the light side, he goes to the dark side. This is what he does. He goes from God's side to Satan's side, he's, but he's not just doing that. He's also climbing the social ladder. Because remember that Jesus' disciples and Jesus him, dis, himself were a bunch of, would have been perceived as a bunch of hillbilly rednecks from Galilee. They were men who would have been seen as rubes. They had a funny Galilean accent. They weren't sophisticated like the upper classes in Jerusalem. And so in switching teams, Judas wasn't just going from good to evil. He was going from the rednecks to the sophisticated. He was climbing the social ladder, and this is probably the nearest Judas had ever been to political power. So as he entered Jerusalem and entered the city lights, the big city lights, and now all of a sudden he was in the presence of political power, is these men welcomed his company for this meeting. So there's more than a switching of the sides of, to good and evil, from good to evil. There's a switching of social standing, at least as Judas perceives it. These are the men of, or the people of Judas's betrayal, the people to whom Judas betrayed our Lord. So we've seen the time, it's on the Tuesday, or after the Tuesday at least. We've seen the person, that's Judas, one of Christ's disciples. We've seen the people to whom he betrayed our Lord. These are the high men of Jerusalem, the power men, the chief priests. And now, for the rest of the sermon, I focus on the actual act of betrayal, the treason, the treachery. Now... There's a lot of theories as to why Judas betrayed Jesus. From the text of Scripture, however, it is safe to conclude that money had something to do with it. He loved money. And beyond that, we are safe to conclude that he hated Jesus. However, we don't really know anything else about why he did it. People concoct and they cook up all kinds of theories why Judas did it. What we know is that he hated Jesus and that money had something to do with it. Beyond that, we don't know anything. So you can hypothesize and guess all you want, but it is, you're, you're pulling that out of, not the text at least. We don't know much more. His hatred and disillusionment with Jesus Christ had le likely been festering for a while. And I suspect that Christ's rebuke at the anointing of Christ, when, the, when Judas whipped up the disciples in last week's passage and against the woman who anointed Jesus, when Judas whipped up the disciples, Jesus rebuked them. So he said in verse 10, Jesus did, but Jesus, aware of this, said to them, why do you trouble this woman? For she has done a beautiful thing to me. For you always have the poor with you, but you will not always have me. In his, he was rebuking the disciples, but everybody knew he was rebuking G Judas. Predominantly because he's the one that whipped them up. So they all knew that Judas was whipping them up. And Judas had likely become the spokesman at this point. And so when Jesus issued that rebuke in general to the disciples, the rebuke would have cut Judas's heart the most. And instead of receiving the rebuke with repentance and humility and meekness from our Savior... I think it's very likely that that is what finally spilled out. That was what rattled him enough so that the hatred really spilled out. Sometimes people can conceal their hatred and their contempt and their hypocrisy for a long time. But then you just put them in that right situation and it just spills out of them like a cup of Kool-Aid on a white carpet. And it looked for a while that that Kool-Aid wouldn't land on the carpet, but it landed. And I think that Judas was provoked sinfully. He himself sinned in, in allowing himself to be provoked this way as our Lord 
rebuked him. And, and take that to heart, by the way. When you are actually rebuked and confronted with the word of God, how do you react? Judas is confronted with the word of God and the greatness of Jesus Christ, and what does he do? He turns on Jesus even more ferociously. What do you do? What do you do when the messenger of God brings you the word of God and it cuts to, you, to your heart? Do you lash out and turn upon the messenger or upon Christ himself like Judas did? Or do you receive it with brokenness and repentance and meekness? It's a good question to ask yourself. His stealing, Judas' stealing, his thievery, as I noted, indicates that he had a sense of entitlement and had thought that Jesus owed him something. And I think it's, it's likely because we know that disciples left their businesses. Most of them were small businessmen, and they actually left their family businesses behind to follow Jesus. And so I think somehow and some, at some point throughout Jesus' ministry as Judas was following him around, he, be, he drew the conclusion that he had given up too much to follow Jesus. And that would have provoked him, that level of entitlement and that grumbling and that murmuring in his heart would have provoked him to steal from the treasury and then eventually provoke him to turn on Jesus to get some more money. And so if you ever find yourself discontent with what Jesus has given you and thinking you've given up too much for Jesus Christ, I want you to remember that that's what Judas did. He didn't think Jesus was worth it. He wasn't worth the sacrifice. He wasn't worth the fact that he followed, left everything to follow him. It wasn't worth the scorn that he was now receiving for being one of his disciples and being associated with him. It wasn't worth the reproach to follow Jesus. Somehow, somewhere, at some point along the line, he regretted giving up so much to follow Jesus. Don't be like Judas. Don't be full of sorrow because you decided to follow Jesus. Don't be full of sorrow because righteousness has cost you something. Because obedience has cost you something. Don't be full of sorrow. Be like this woman that we read of last week who anointed him and treasured him supremely. Now he was meeting a need. Judas was. The chief priests were concerned about a public reaction. In verse 5, we saw that. The chief priests said, in verse 5, not during the feast, lest there be an uproar among the people. They were concerned about a public reaction. And so they didn't know how they could get Jesus because they couldn't get him publicly when they knew where he was because then they feared there'd be a public reaction. And they likely didn't know where he was when he was in private. So there was a need that needed to be met. There was a market. Can't get him publicly because there's going to be a public reaction, and we can't find him privately, so how are we going to get him? Well, Jesus, or Judas solved the quandary. Matthew Henry says, they durst not meddle with him in public and know not where to find him in private. Here the matter rested, and the difficulty was inseparable till Judas came and offered them his service. There was a demand and Judas supplied it. And he supplied it for a price. And by the way, Judas himself is the one that initiated the meeting. So we know that he was seeking out to meet this demand. Look at what it says. It doesn't say they approached him. It says he went to them. Verse 14 says he went. Verse 15, he said. Verse 15, there's an emphatic, in the Greek, an emphatic I. What will you give me if I deliver him. Verse 15, then one of the twelve, whose name was Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests. Verse 15, and said, what will you give me if I deliver him? This is Judas' action. It's, it's emphatic. He initiated the meeting. He's the main actor. In fact, the, the only thing the chief priests do, they don't even speak. They just paid him. Verse 15. Look what it says. Verse 15. And he said, what will you give me if I deliver him over to you? And they paid him 30 pieces of silver. Doesn't even say they spoke to him. He thought he was mingling with the upper classes. And finally, he was getting in with the, 
with the, with the higher ups and he'd been exposed to political power, but they don't even, at least Matthew doesn't indicate, they didn't have the respect for Judas to even say anything to him. It's almost like, yeah, here's 30 pieces of silver, get lost. It's very crude. Everything is Judas. Judas went, Judas said, Judas emphasized that he will betray him. They just pay him. Judas is the doer of all the actions. By the way, his sin was premeditated. There's one thing, I mean, it's sin is sin is sin is sin. You sin in the moment, that's sin. You need to repent of it, there's consequences for it. You need Christ's forgiveness. But premeditated sin is that much more serious. And this was premeditated. He thought it through, he planned it out, he plotted, and he acted. And by the way, he used, he used inside information to act out on his sin. So he had the information not only of where Jesus would be, because he was going to provide that to the, the um, chief priests. Not only did he have information of where Jesus would be, but he had inside information that these would be the men that would betray Jesus. So chapter 16, verse 21, Jesus teaches his disciples. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and raised on the third day. So Judas had that information because Jesus was consistently teaching it. Jesus said in 20, verse 18, See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death. You see what I'm saying? And even chapter 26, verse 2, today's chapter, a few weeks ago, the text, it says, You know that after two days the Passover is coming, and the Son of Man will be delivered up to be crucified. And so Judas had this inside information, not only of where Jesus would be, his whereabouts, but he had inside information that Jesus was going to be killed by the chief priests, and he got that from Jesus, and so he uses the inside information for his own gain as a traitor. He betrays him. His access to privilege teaching opened the door to darkness. That's a lesson for you. Knowledge of the things of God and knowledge of good things and right things. Information, you can use information for good, you can use true information for evil. Take your pick, right? Judas decided to use truth for evil. You can use truth for good, you can use truth for evil. If you use truth for evil, don't ever use the, the excuse, oh, I was just telling the truth. Judas could have used that excuse. I was just telling the truth. Judas, one of Judas's sins is that he told the truth. Hope you understand that. He went to the chief priests and he told them where Jesus was. He told the truth. You can sin in telling the truth. Don't ever forget that. Well, he betrays him for 30 pieces of silver and said, what will you give me if I deliver him over to you? And they paid him 30 pieces of silver, verse 15. Now, that wasn't worth much. It might have been worth a month's wages. Some people say it was worth about 20 bucks. Month's wages to 20 bucks. It wasn't worth much. And, you know, you think about he got 30 pieces of silver. He got it from the priests with all the money changing hands in the temple. Do you think he could have driven a harder bargain? This is, this is how cheap he saw Jesus. And it's not just how cheap he saw Jesus. It's how cheap the chief priests saw Jesus. This is just an, as much an act of contempt on their part. What's Jesus worth? Ah, 20 bucks. That's what he's worth. Exodus chapter 21, verse 32 says, If the ox gores a slave, male or female, the owner 
shall give to their master 30 shekels of silver, and the ox shall be stoned. So he's worth the price of a wounded slave. And yet you compare this to the alabaster jar in the previous text. Maybe a year's wages are an or entire retirement savings, something like that. And the alabaster jar is poured on Jesus, and Judas is outraged over the alabaster jar being poured on Jesus because he's not worth that much. Well, what is he worth to Judas? Maybe 20 bucks to a month's wages. Month's wages at the most. What's he worth to the chief priest with all the money changing hands in the temple? 30 pieces of silver. Zechariah 11 verse 13 says, Then the Lord said to me, Throw it to the potter, the lordly price at which I was pierced by them. So I took the 30 pieces of silver and threw them into the house of the Lord. The potter, to the potter. 30 pieces of silver in Zechariah 11 is used to pay a shepherd that lets his flock die. The shepherd who lets his flock die receives 30 pieces of silver in Zechariah 11. Judas is a worthless shepherd. He's a worthless shepherd. He was supposed to be one of the shepherds of Israel in the kingdom of God, but he's a worthless shepherd because he could be bought with give or take a little, well, take a little, not give or take, take a little, 30 pieces of silver. A month's wages. Take a little a month's wages. A worthless shepherd. What Judas represents in our text today are compromised pastors. Specifically. The application is broader to compromised Christians. But specifically, there's a leader and shepherd in Israel, compromised pastors who won't honor Christ for fear of losing givers in the church. How many churches, elders boards, and deacons boards, governing bodies of churches, how many of them are Judases? And they say, well, we just don't want to rock the boat. And really what they're saying is, we don't want to say it. We don't want to act. We don't want to execute the word of God. We don't want to apply the word of God precisely or clearly because we might lose a tither or a giver or a giving unit or two. And that's what it comes down to. And they can sign orthodox doctrinal statements and even open the word of God every Sunday and everything in the church can look right. But within their hearts, they love money more than Jesus and they'll sell him for 15, 10, or 5 pieces of silver if they can. He's worth far less to them than Judas, than he was to Judas. They are Judases. I could draw even perhaps more relevant. He might represent all of the compromised pastors who wouldn't care for their flocks for fear of fines. It's not worth it. I don't want to give from the Lord's treasury. I don't want to put my neck on the line for the fines. I actually saw a text message was forwarded to me. It was a screenshot of another pastor. I won't say his name. You'd know who he was if I said his name. It was forwarded to me from one of his congregants when we were getting our fines levied against us. We were getting um, uh, contempt of court charges and everything. And the pastor had his congregant came to him and he said, we should be doing what Trinity does. And he shot him a message back to him. And the congregant eventually got to me. He said to the pastor, said to him, they're wasting the Lord's money. Think about that. That's Judas. That is Judas. He represents the church leadership boards that won't honor Christ for fear of losing their givers. And he represents the pastors who compromise during lockdowns for fear of fines. They're all Judases. Like Esau, they sell their birthrights for a bowl of soup. Now, can they repent? Sure. 
Before it's too late, absolutely. But if they don't, I'm not optimistic for them. Judas represents that. He is supposed to go down in history to let us know how easy it is to betray the Lord for a cheap price. That's what we're supposed to get from Judas. Do you see how easy it is? And unlike the woman in the previous text, they do not grasp the worthiness of Christ. He's cheap to them. They'll honor him with their mouths, but not in their hearts if they can just draw a meager salary. A meager salary. If they can just draw a meager salary. They'll honor him with their mouths, but not in their hearts. The reason he hated, Judas hated this woman's worship, is not because the woman's worship took from the poor. The reason he hated this woman's worship is because he couldn't fathom why anyone would think Jesus is worth that much. It, it couldn't, he could not comprehend it. And, and this, is what, this is what pure Christianity does to hypocrites. It blows their minds. They don't know how to handle it. Because the only thing they've been doing their whole life is going through the motions and operating like a Christian, but they've never been born again. And all of a sudden, they encounter pure Christianity, and it blows their minds, and they react in unpredictable ways, just like Judas reacted over that woman who anointed Jesus with that expensive oil. He couldn't fathom that anyone would actually think that Jesus is worth it. Just give the money to the poor. Such is the vain and fake professor of Christ. By the way, if you want to see if someone is truly converted, show me what he's been willing to give up for Jesus. Show me what he's been willing to give up for Jesus. I mean, it's, it's unfathomable, I think, in our day and age, with our culture as hateful as it is towards the things of God and as wicked as it's become, it's almost unfathomable that you can be a faithful Christian and not give up something for Jesus right now. It's almost unfathomable. But yet there's professing Christians that do it all the time because the, the goal of the Christian in the 21st century of Canada is so often, well, just let me profess a correct and orthodox doctrinal statement without rocking the boat, and then I'm a faithful believer. And that's basically what it comes down to. The question is, is, is what's your price? Can you be bought? And for those who are fake and hypocrites, the price typically isn't very high. It's not high. And from that point forward, Judas had a single-minded mission in verse 16. And from that moment, he sought an opportunity to betray him. He would not renege. It was over. His pride had the best of him. He'd given the chief priest his word. He could have cast himself on the mercy of Jesus Christ at any moment in that time. He could have gone to Jesus for grace and mercy and forgiveness. He could have, but he, he did not want to do that. He was completely given over to the dark side. His heart had become so hard that he would not renege. His pride had the best of him. He was going to show the chief priest that he was good on his word, and he was going to get Jesus for them. Do you find yourself deep into sin and you don't want to get out and you don't want to leave it for fear of being exposed, for fear of what it might do to you, for fear of what it might do to somebody else? Are you deep into sin? Because Judas wouldn't leave the sin. And so today I just want to invite you, don't be a Judas. Come to Jesus and throw yourself at him for mercy. Any shame that you might feel for coming clean on your sin is infinitely better than the reproach of hell forever that Judah suffered. Abandoned your path of destruction. You should. Come to Jesus Christ. Do you want to know if someone's really converted? What have they given up for Christ? It's an application point. Greed is a very dangerous thing. Discontent is a dangerous thing. Thanklessness is a dangerous thing. Thankless people are dangerous people. Discontent people are dangerous people. 
Greedy people are dangerous people, especially thankless, discontent, greedy people who profess to know Jesus Christ. They're dangerous people. They're like Judas. And, and treachery, by the way, as I noted, is not often, often treachery is not telling lies. It's telling the truth to the wrong people. It's using the truth the wrong way. Thomas Manton the Puritan said that sin is like a wedge. Have you ever wedged a, a piece of wood to chop the wood with an axe or you drive a wedge into it? It's the, it's the finest point that goes in first so the wood splits. That's what sin is. Sin starts with a little seed, but then it drives right into your life and causes destruction. And Judas, it would have started with a little sense of discontent, a little bit of regret for following Jesus, a little bit of thinking that he was entitled for something that Jesus wasn't going to give him. That's where it all started. And then it goes to full blowing treason so that for the rest of human history, the name Judas is associated with the word traitor. And it all started with a little wee seed. Sin is a wedge. Manton also said that sin is, is like starting a fire. If you're going to start a blazing inferno, typically what are you going to do? You're going to get some, a little bit of paper and the twigs, and then that's enough to pile on more wood and more wood and more wood until you have a great hot fire. That's what sin is. It starts with a little small spark and then more wood. Satan won't stop with a little wood. He'll put more wood and more wood and more wood and more wood on until you just full-throated repent. That's the only way out of it. And then the salvation of God will come to you. That's what happened to Judas. And hypocrites can fit into a church very easily for a season, just like Judas. And I say that not primarily to provoke you towards suspicion. That's not my aim here. My primary objective in noting that Judases and hypocrites can fit into churches for a season is to provoke you to self-examination. It shouldn't be sitting there thinking, well, I wonder if my neighbor is a Judas. It should be sitting there thinking, where is the Judas in my heart? And let me find him and kill him. I want him dead. I don't want him in there. That little wee tip of the spear of the sin. The little wee seed of sin. I must kill it. Lest I go down this ter terrible road. And, and you can't be exposed. Or by the way, you can be exposed to the glory and power of Christ. You can witness his miracles and teaching. And you can hear his preaching from his own mouth. And still be a false convert like Judas. So yeah, I, I'm trying to... I'm trying to prod your heart a little right now. You can see the glory of Christ right in front of your eyes. You can hear him talk. You can listen to him preach. You can hear him pray for you. You can eat the fish and the loaves that he divided, and you can see him raise Lazarus from the dead, and you can still be a false professor of the gospel. Claiming to love him with your lips, but not in your heart. And the more position you have in the kingdom of God, the more opportunity you have to be a Judas. The more prominent you are in the kingdom, the more opportunity you have to be a Judas. Matthew Henry said, if Judas had not been an apostle, he would, have not have, he would not have been a traitor. It would have been impossible for him to be a traitor if he hadn't been an apostle. So the higher you up in God's kingdom, the more prominent you are in God's kingdom, the more dangerous it is. And Judas, by the way, forsook an opportunity. Salvation was right there in front of him. It was offered to him every day for three years as he followed Christ around. He had salvation right there. He forsook an opportunity. If anyone ever forsook an opportunity, it was Judas. But listen, little children, all the children in this room, I want you to listen to me who are growing up in Christian homes and your parents are teaching you about the gospel of Jesus Christ. I want you to pay very, very close attention. It is possible to hear about Jesus every day of your life and then to turn out to be a Judas. You little children need to be born again and you need to run from sin fast. You don't want to go down this road. You don't want to sit there and resent the teaching that your, children, your parents are providing you. You don't want to sit there and be bitter because your parents are telling you to obey God's law and follow after Jesus Christ and trust Him for the forgiveness of sins. You don't want to do that because this is where that leads. Not only will it break your parents' hearts, and it sure will break your parents' hearts, but more importantly, you will become a Judas to Christ. 
And you will be found on the day of judgment as the same place that Judas is found. And it's not too late for you. I'm telling you it's not too late for you. And the reason I know it's not too late for you is because you're still able to hear the pleas of the gospel and the cry to come to Jesus Christ. So won't you come to Jesus? Why would you wait? Why would you wait? Why would you spurn the free gift of God's grace if it's been there in front of you your entire life? And to lash out at free grace and dying love. And Judas' price was cheap. C.H. Spurgeon said, however cheap it was, yet many have sold Jesus for a less price than Judas received. They've sold him for a smile or a sneer has been su sufficient to induce them to betray their Lord. Some of you have sold him for watching porn for 15 minutes. Judas at least got about a month's wages. And you sold him to watch porn for 15 minutes. And now you're hooked and you can't get out. Some of you sold Jesus Christ out long ago because you don't want to receive the reproach of the world. Or you want to receive the smile of the world. Far cheaper price than Judas sold him out for. The only way to prevent this, I am convinced of it, the only way to prevent this is to be born again so you don't become a traitor of Jesus Christ. And you must perceive the worthiness of Jesus Christ. Judas didn't perceive the worthiness of Christ. So he spurned the free offer of grace. He, Christ didn't, he, Christ's blood didn't atone for his sins. And he went straight to hell. Mary perceived the worthiness of Christ. Judas didn't. And the reason people sell out on Jesus is because they think he's cheap. But if you perceive that Jesus is worthy of all honor and all glory and all praise, he's worthy of everything, you won't sell out on him. Because he'll have you. So remember that. If you remember anything from today's sermon, remember that Jesus Christ is worthy.